Hello and welcome to the Nish Guarda YouTube podcast series. We're here again to discuss people that are changing the world and people that are inspiring us to better narratives and better ways of looking how we can actually cope better between ourselves, with our creativity, with our technology, with our human. And um, in this series, we've been always bringing people that we admire, people that I like. And in this episode today, I'm particularly excited in our series right now in partnership with freedomx.com and citiesabc.com and openbusinesscouncil.org to portray someone that is in the bridge of a lot of different areas that are critical for our society. So entertainment, film, and as well, social impact. And um, so I wanted to introduce uh, for our series today, uh, Valentina Castigliani, that is an award-winning film producer and the president of the Queen Studios Entertainment. And uh, Valentina has a fantastic uh, profile that is, of course, she was uh, associated with one of the son of the legends of Hollywood. That is actually one of my favorite actors of all time. But I think uh, one of the things that I love about the work of Valentina is the work as a film producer, as well as a president and chairman of Queen Studio Entertainment that continues the legacy of the Academy Award-winning actor Anthony Quinn in the fields of arts and entertainment. But as well, she's kind of an out-of-the-box personality. Um, she won the prestigious US Congress Award, the Human Rights Award, the English Wift Awards as visionary producer, together with Chancellor of Germany, Angela Merkel. I don't need to say more. And of course, the actress Gal Gadot. But I, I love the way uh, Valentin is very focused as a producer and as a personality in looking at the bridge between entertainment, documentary, research, and social impact. And as well, working with some of the leading global organizations, but as well, always looking at the ways you can actually further and foster new solutions and new ways of impacting and creating social good, which I think we need, especially in our world of uh, very frenetic technology, but as well with wonderful things, but a lot of challenging ones as well. So Valentina, it's an honor to have you here. It's a pleasure to be with you, Denis. Oh my God, what a beautiful presentation. Thank you so, so much. And welcome. Hello. Good morning Thank from you. Los Angeles, the shores of Malibu. Well, it's much better than London. <laughs> so I, I, <laughs> I am sure, there. yes. I just yeah. arrived from the Emirates and uh, believe me, then it's just uh, waking up in front of the Pacific Ocean with the breeze, the sound of the waves. Uh, oh my God, what a blessing. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. I hope I can meet you one, one of these days over there. Absolutely. Well, uh, count on it. Uh, completely. So, Valentina, I wanted to start with, uh, I always like to look at, these interviews uh, based on people and uh, what makes you drive to achieve what you are achieving, but as well to be the person you are today. So let's look a bit. I know that you are from Italy. You are a citizen of the world right now, but a bit of your background and your history, because let's start with that. Well, I grew up in Florence, Tuscany, from a, a family uh, that uh, is a, imbued with entertainment. In fact, uh, uh, my family owned an opera theater since two centuries ago, the Teatro Verdi in Florence and many other cinemas. My grandfather, legendary Riccardo Castellani, was uh, the president of Anikagis, the international distribution in Europe. And he was uh, a producer and financer of many of those beautiful uh, films of the golden era of Italian cinemas, including some of the Fellini films. And, uh, and uh, he was owning these beautiful theaters uh, that were trespassed in my family from my great grandfather and so much more back in there. So uh, I grew up behind the stage watching uh, ballet and classic opera and classic music and concerts and theaters and plays. And I guess uh, it, it did have an effect on me for sure, yes. And then I finished my studies in Paris. I graduated and then moved to America. And uh, I, I, 25 years almost, 20 for sure, years later, I'm, I'm very, very glad. Looking back, it seemed like it was written in a book, my life, in the good parts, but also in the sad parts that, that propelled me to make even more courageous choices. Oh, that's that's uh, 
legacy, it's a wonderful legacy from your family of the two centuries of history. And as well, you continue to that, that wonderful legacy of your grandfather. And as well, of course, with uh, some of the legends of the history of cinema. And uh, as well, part of your life has been around this. So, so I want to, before we start going to your achievements and as well your career. So yeah. when I think someone that, that is born in something like this, sometimes this is overwhelming. And uh, I'm sure that uh, at a certain point, of course, is a huge weight, especially for a child to bear on his, on his back. Depends if the family is more functional or dysfunctional. But I would like to hear how do you cope with that? Because at the end of the day, one of the things that I've been trying to portray in this series, and we have been having the most different personalities from uh, high-profile technologies to government ministers and so forth. And one of the things that is common is how people deal with the challenges. And we have all kinds of, of course, backgrounds, but yours is, is kind of a royalty background and the entertainment industry. So a bit, how did you cope with this kind of uh, legacy and probably weight of the legacy that uh, there was on your back? And you continue with, with a wonderful way. Well, definitely you're right, Dennis. There is a, an overwhelming part. We were uh, educated with this impeccable education. I remember um, being taught how to eat with books under my arms to keep my elbows straight and asking permission to stand up, permission to sit down and on and on. I remember going with my grandparents and us, all the cousins and stuff and, and having to be aware that you were watched. And so uh, that, that is a sensation to be watched because for a kid it is not normal to feel I'm watched. Uh, but in that case, you know, my, my grandfather always insisted and, and, and it was a, a very strong legacy uh, in culture, the arts, education, and a very high profile. So it, it certainly uh, imposed this on us. Said that, uh, um, among the 10 niece and nephews that we were, I was uh, the one uh, closest to my grandfather. And uh, still nowadays, I feel it was probably one of my biggest, if not the biggest mentor in my life. And uh, I am very sad that uh, he died when I was 12. So I couldn't take advantage of how much he loved me in particular out of all these nieces and nephews. In fact, he wanted me to sit there were these long, long tables and every weekend and every summer we would spend it with my grandparents on purpose to fulfill education, to be part of this family in the villas at the oceans or the villas in Florence, etc. And uh, all the cousins were sitting at the bottom of one side of the table, except me, that I was requested to sit next to my grandfather. And as a kid, I felt it was so sad that I couldn't have fun with all the other kids. I couldn't understand that this, this man actually loved me profoundly and understood my nature more than I could understand at the time and wanted me close to him. Now thinking back, I, I think about it dearly and it encouraged me tremendously in very many times of, uh, of uh, challenge, of, of, uh, of sadness to, to have that kind of bond with the figure that maybe is already gone, but somehow the energy of it is still there. So uh, very, very beautiful. Uh, connection sort of saying and legacy definitely you know and uh, with this big legacy you have to kind of accept uh, where what they come with you know and uh, in my case in the end it was a very happy story uh, but it came with responsibilities you were totally right and once I came in Hollywood I actually understood the importance of that code of honor and, and I felt blessed and grateful that I had it already, that was imbued in my education, in my, in, in my, in my upbringing, in my persona, so I could sit with any kings and queens, sort of saying, and, and feel completely at ease. Or, or when I have to give a speech at US Congress, at United Nations, it, it comes back that kind of posture of the books under my elbows you know I have to write a book with that kind of title because it, it really does define um, 
the, the, the line of, of being of a person. It didn't oh, that, 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 It's really special and beautiful because the, I think that story, I, I hope my children will have the relationship that you have with your grandfather. Yes. But as well, it's beautiful because, of course, that discipline and that, uh, of course, uh, and I know that Italy is very... Patrium, there's a sense of patriarchism that is very strong. So as well, it was very powerful. So, so I want to, so from your studies and from this, of course, baptism of fire with your family. Yes. How did you decide to start in the entertainment industry? And of course, going to film. And of course, you end up actually as well, having a, a relationship with one of the, as well, another legend <laughs> of, of film history. But how did it go from picking that, that uh, bringing to actually create your own career and your own path? Well, Dennis, I have to say, I always say like in Harry Potter is the one that chose the wizard. He's never vice versa. And it was like that in my life, I tell you. Um, you know, it came to me. Um, I did uh, do some acting a little bit when I was young, but more like uh, it fell onto me, obviously being in a cinema environment, but I never really pursue it. Uh, I was a designer, actually. I have a master degree in design and fine arts that I uh, finished acquiring in Paris and, uh, and at FIT, New York. So uh, for me, life was always about creativity and art. I love painting and designing. Uh, but then later, of course, you know, I, I knew Francesco Quinn as a friend and um, uh, Anthony Quinn did work with my grandfather who did co-finance La Strada of Fellini. So the family did know. Wow. I do yeah. remember Yolanda, his wife, uh, recalling my grandmother actually and we were laughing with Francesco to say oh my god if they were alive you know uh, and and for a long time I was just friend with Francesco you know we both had our lives and um, at one point then uh, we found each other and uh, we were both uh, single finally and uh, and I, I think we were together since the moment we met again and uh, we started to talk, you know, and uh, and we dis rediscovered each other in a, in a different kind of angle, you know, when you start to be a little bit more of an adult, if we can say, you know, and uh, and you're not 20 anymore, maybe you're 30, you know, and so you understand a little bit more of uh, what, what uh, a relationship is about, what a person you choose is about, and uh, certainly we chose each other very dearly and uh, since then obviously then if i had already a background in cinema and entertainment and theaters and the arts now we were two together and uh, and so it was very powerful uh, we were very inspired by each other's and uh, and very in love of course and um and, and we started to, to have a million projects, you know, Francesco was coming from a difficult time at work and stuff, but uh, together we overcome it and it be, went back to be on top of the game and filming TV series international in England, Italy, America, uh, feature films, uh, and uh, it was just on the verge of starting to produce, you know, we did uh, some theaters and some uh, some put together some scripts and stuff and unfortunately as you know he died suddenly and very unexpectedly of a heart attack he was a fervent cyclist and uh, although it was very healthy he paid a toll at 47 years old to uh, to train with uh, champions as uh, Lance Armstrong or Mark Cavendish uh, uh, etc so um, and he died while playing with our kids. He was completely unaware, you know, in front of the house and uh, they were just uh, ruffling each other and, and he dropped. So that was a terrifying moment, a, a, a learning curve that completely changed our life in three minutes. My life as I knew it was gone in pieces and it felt like falling. I always say and recall a story when I talk in public because it's important to show 
who we are as people, I think, and not thinking as public figures, you know, these, uh, these words of public figures, celebrities are overused to the point where we don't see the person behind and what draw the person to take some decision to create something. But uh, I remember that uh, his uh, reading glasses were still sitting on the bedside table after he died, in the months after he died. And uh, uh, every time I would go to sleep, I would take these glasses and hold them tight, like a handle that would prevent me from falling. Night after night, I would take these glasses and hold them tight until one night, I took these glasses, Dennis, and then I opened my hand and I put them down. I decided. I decided to fall and not be afraid anymore. It is from that simple symbolic gesture that all abundance came into my life. A month later, I created Queen Studios Entertainment. And in a year, we had our first film that was candidate for an Academy Award and a Golden Globe, The Butterfly Stream is on Netflix. Uh, and, and then we, we did uh, documentaries about peace in the Middle East. We spoke at United Nations, the US Congress, all because of that simple symbolic gesture of putting the glasses down. Now, why am I telling you this story? Because not everybody can relate to an Oscar, an Academy Award and stuff, but we can all relate to such simple gestures in our life that can really bend our destiny, shift our way of thinking and make us see in a different way, take courageous choices and look ahead. So that, that's pretty much how I started production. Uh, I'm speechless and it's beautiful. And uh, I'm sorry for what I'm, I'm sure it was a very, very powerful moment. I lost my brother as well. Uh, that was 10, young, 10 years younger than me. So I know for you as a husband and uh, as someone so close, how, how this marks your life. But it's, it's beautiful as well, the way you, you took it to become stronger and to make who you are even more special. So it's, it's really beautiful. And, and thank you for sharing this moment with us. I think for this is what makes life special is these moments as well. So thank you for that. Very grateful. So, so the way you've been uh, as a producer is very unconventional because you've been kind of a, a high profile film producer, but as well, very kind of a social impact driven and as well focus on, on creating all these elements of, uh, social impact, uh, creating causes on looking at these things, documentaries and things like that. So um, can you tell a bit about the, the way you've been producing and the way you make your choices? Because I think that's particularly important, especially in a time of blockbusters where cinema is kind of merging into the, the kind of the streaming houses and so forth. Yes, no, it's, it's very true, Dennis, you know, I choose projects, uh, they, they come to me, but of course there is a choice, a lot of projects, a lot of script comes to you and, and you have to discern, and to me, you see, I'm a storyteller, I really like, what, what does a story does in life, does it inspire you, does it drive you forward, does it make you think different, uh, so to me, uh, the story, whatever story I take, has to have that element to drive forward to inspire but on, not only that but to challenge and the first one that takes the challenge is me i usually choose projects that are extremely impossible to make for me in that moment in my life you know not in general but like i i, I want to tell you the story of that documentary one rock three religions you know it's on amazon now right now and it won many, many awards, including the US Congress Award and the Human Rights Award and many others. But uh, when, when uh, it was presented to me, uh, this young director, Isaac Hertz, came to me and he's a, a, a young Orthodox uh, uh, gentleman, uh, Jewish Orthodox, and came to me. And this was right after I finished the Oscar campaign for the Butterfly's Dream. And he told me, I saw your work and I would like you to produce a, a documentary about the Temple Mountain. And I looked at this amazing, beautiful young human being that looked at me with such honesty, with such genuinity. And I, I just, my heart opened, but at the same time, I had to be very objective to say, Isaac, you know, I love that you come to me with that and that you saw my work, but 
I don't think I'm the right person to tell that story because I'm not, I'm not Jewish and I'm not Palestinian. So I think if you'd have to tell that story, you have to have a little bit of that history inside your, your veins and is insisting and is insisting. I was like, no, but look, I saw how you work. I saw the person you are and stuff. I, I'm convinced you're the right person. So I, and I thank God I did, I took a week. I said, look, I mean, you, you, you opened my heart because I could see how genuine this guy was. I said, uh, let me think for a week. And in that week, Dennis, it occurred to me that my best goal in life, no matter what was the achievement, came from a state of very difficult uncomfortability, where I felt so uncomfortable to face the challenge, where I didn't know anything about it, where I had to really walk outside my shoes, outside my comfort zone to achieve that and learn. And based on that feeling, I went back to Isaac and I said, yes, being obviously aware that this journey had a lot of learning for me because I realized right away, this wasn't just a documentary about a topic. This was becoming a movement that was uh, to be with presidents, with United Nations, with diplomatics, with the US Congress, uh, with people that you had to really stamp your passport to speak with not only to interview them, but to be even seen by them. And so, uh, so I started this journey uh, with, with incredible humility because I understood this is something I do not know. This is something I have to learn from scratch. So let's start this journey. But when in a storytelling, you know, even the Cinderella story, there is that kind of enlightening moment that says to you, if you do approach with that kind of a candid spirit, the universe helps you. And it's always been like that. I'm a firm believer that an artist has to have this, this belief ingrained inside their instrument, you know? So there we go. I read on the paper when we just started shooting that the Pope just went to Israel and pray uh, at the wall uh, and, um, and asked the two presidents, President Shimon Peres and President uh, Mahmoud Abbas to pray together at the Vatican. I said, that's it. That's how we have to start this documentary. But of course, who could grant me the permission to be at this historical event that uh, security was so high, not even a plane was allowed to fly over Italy in the week these two presidents were in Rome. I mean, it was insane. So, you know, I, I had to recover to my humanity, to my human resources, and, uh, and I Googled the Pope. It's, it's exactly how I did it. <laughs> I Googled the Pope, the Vatican, and I found out that there were 30 minutes every day that the Vatican would take phone calls. Obviously, most of these phone calls were to visit the Vatican garden and so on, you know, stuff like that. So I, at three o'clock in the morning, Los Angeles time, I called the Vatican and I started to speak with the nun. And, and right away it came very obvious to me, Dennis, that no matter what I would say, my credit, my name, legacy, whatever, it was completely irrelevant to this nun. So eventually, you know, she passed me to the director of the press office, Father Lombardi, with which I started what I call my 10 nights confession. In fact, <laughs> this guy, <laughs> Would this guy would take me for these 30 minutes on a journey, a very intimate personal journey that had nothing to do with the film. It was about my personal choices, my life, my feelings, uh, my relationship with the, my kid, uh, my family, and on and on, my beliefs. And at the end of the 30 minutes, every night, three o'clock in the morning, I remember it, <laughs> Uh, it would tell me, okay, Valentina, let's continue this conversation tomorrow. Call me back. And this went on for 10 nights until we were like three days, I swear to God, 
three days before this historical event. And I'm like, Father Lombardi, I mean, now it's been 10 nights that we're talking. We have to make a decision in here on how to go farther on. Uh, we have this, this meeting coming up and I have a crew that have to pass all security, CIA, forget it. And it's like, very well, you're gonna be the only one filming at the Vatican. And there we were three days later with Pope Francis in the Vatican garden and these two presidents. And that's how it goes. And I tell this story to young filmmakers that always believe, oh, but if you're not somebody, if you don't have enough money, if you don't, it's the story that has to carry you, not vice versa. You have to find a way where the story is carrying you, where there is a thread that you are following, just like uh, Ansel and Gretel with the little white stones in the story, you know, like just like Cinderella with the, with the fairy coming up and putting the, the dress and knowing that at midnight the dress is gone. You know, you have to follow the story. You have to find the thread. I believe that a leader is uh, leading people, but a leader is led by his own cause. So in my case, is the film is leading me. The story of the film is leading me. And since that moment, of course, you know, if we thought that we were just five filmmakers believing in an idea, after if the Pope was believing in us, we understood that we, we were a tribe around the world wanting to make it happen. The film obviously won 18 international awards, uh, the US Congress, da, da, da. And, uh, and since then, obviously the courage of believing in a story, the courage of breaking boundaries and finding subjects that are uncomfortable or maybe um, unlit by society yet, uh, uh, drove an appetite in me for sure. Well, that, that's a wonderful masterclass, not just in the story and the production, but as well in human uh, skills, because that shows as well the skill that, and I think you're completely right. I think you need to have a sense of narrative and story, but as well a sense of determination to get something done. And I think that show your persistence, but as well your patience and as well your human uh, humanity, because in the end of the day, you, feel, you build a film about humanity, but you are as well were honest about that. That's really impressive story. It's one of the most beautiful stories and it's, it's really a very special moment. So thank you so much for that. It's a, just sharing this is amazing. And I was educated by priests and bishops. And so I have as well that, uh, that sense of uh, understanding what you're talking about in my case. No, it's, it's wonderful. So, so from, from this, because you as well, you, you mentioned the Butterfly Dream that was as well a candidate for Academy Awards. So you have actually in the last five years, fantastic um, achievements because it's, it's three years you achieve a fantastic uh, uh, reach. So it's mostly, so from this kind of choices, so you've been actually always choosing really difficult topics that I would say the most difficult you have in the planet, very polemic and very controversial, but at the same time you handle it in a very, like you just mentioned, humanity, I would say humanity way, but as well in a very humble and fantastic. That's why I think the, the, the films have been so successful. But yeah. I would touch more like as you as a producer and as, we, as you, you as, as taking this forward, there's a, a huge component of work from uh, taking a film like this that are not conventional films. We're not talking about the blockbuster. We're talking about very special films that are normally not necessary films that the masses look, right. but you actually achieve a fantastic way of touching very deep topics that are very sensitive. So I'd like to see, for instance, when you distribute a film like this, when you take it to festivals, um, and I think sharing with young people that are listening to us and so forth, how, how would be your advice, and I'm sure, I'm sure at least the, the people listening to us that are in film definitely should learn from you, but I, I would do touch this because it's really a very complex task because in your end it's, cha it's challenging topics and so forth. Yes. Well, first of all, there is one big mistake that I noticed that uh, most of young people do. They make the film, they find the budget for the film, they don't even think about the marketing campaign. Big mistake. 50% of your film is your marketing campaign. 50%, not 10, not 20, 
So uh, one of the most important part is when you gather the budget, when you meet with your financiers, when you decide how to structure your budget and divide it, make sure that you have a good amount for the marketing campaign. Because when the film is finally done, recut, reviewed, da da da, whatever, you have the best direction, the best music and stuff. If you don't have the money to actually bring it around, the film will stay stale until you gather again new finances. And that is a, it takes a lapse of time where the film becomes old or stale and you don't have any more the enthusiasm that you had by finishing, making it and stuff. So very, very important thing to calculate the budget for the marketing campaign on it right away. And then we have to have the honesty. One you're shooting, is this an Oscar film or is this a, a more uh, niche film? Where is he gonna win this film? I mean, when, uh, when, when we made The Butterfly's Dream, we knew that this film could, could run for an Oscar. So of course, the, the campaign was all geared towards that way, you know, it was the a Turkish film at the Oscar in 2015, you know, and it had that kind of, uh, that kind of uh, way. But in the sense, for example, of a smaller film, like uh, One Rock to Religions or other I've done, uh, we, we, it's not an Oscar film, it's, it's a documentary, not necessarily an Oscar documentary, it's a topic that is sensitive, you know, so how do you run it? In that sense, you have to decide it. Uh, if it's a political uh, documentary or a social documentary, it may actually have the opportunity, just like this documentary had, to become a movement and not just a film. One, uh, a filmmaker has to understand that right now, filmmaking, a film, is the most impactful platform to convey an idea. So use it. Uh, what, what I thought, you know, it's like a chess game, a, a, a marketing campaign for a film. So to me, this film had to be worked, yes, on festivals, but also at a diplomatic level. So we structured a series of screening and presentations with the United Nations, US Congress, World Affairs Council, Council on Foreign Relations, uh, Davos, uh, and on and on with the Wiesenthal Center, the universities, the Jerusalem universities, uh, the United Nations and, and uh, UNESCO. Uh, we, we presented this documentary as a document of what was happening and not just a film. And that made a, an insane difference, you know, and that's also where the power of a movie resides. This film was telling a story from a, a neutral point of view. In fact, one of the most challenging part was uh, to have the same amount of material from the Israeli part as well as the Palestinian. We couldn't insert in the film an interview from the Israeli side, for example, unless we had this correspondent into the Palestinian side. You know, we decided to be just observers. And then we went to US Congress to present this, this film because we knew we could have an impact based on the footage and the interview we took. The movie, it was screened at the US Congress. Yes, it won the US Congress award, but most important besides award, two new bills of rights were created because of that screening in the protections of minorities in the Middle East. And that's the power of a film nowadays. So you see, it's not just about film festival. There are a million venues nowadays, organizations, uh, uh, foundations, universities that can take your film as a document about a topic that can inspire, that can make you reflect. And uh, do not think because you're not winning an award in some of these organizations that is going to be less important. It will have a voice that will propel the film even farther. So very, very important, structure your marketing campaign according to the topic and make the topic flourish in all different directions. 
well, this is a masterclass in in uh, in film production, but as well in, in I would say in anything in business because you're completely right. Actually, it's one of the things I've been learning. I tell actually my team is is doing the content is just half of the way. It's yeah. the other fifty percent that is the most important thing. So yeah. that that brings me well, amazing, and I'm I wonder. Uh, it's wonderful to share just this moment with you because. I, I, it's a very special your energy, but as well the way you you take things in a very um, deep and very straightforward. That's what I love because it's very difficult to to get this as well because most of the people are so um, out of focus, very blurred, and I think that's one of the biggest problems probably of our society. So that brings me to one question related, um, and I would like to touch that uh, related to your career because your career has been really fantastic because you have. Uh, made very special films and i think we can talk uh, about uh, if you want to highlight one or two more but yes. I'm, I'm particularly interested uh, because you have uh, of course we talk about the butterflies dream and we'll put all these links in the interview uh, documentation for people to be able uh, to see it uh, and and, uh, and uh, valentina just mentioned amazon or netflix and yes. they are quite well-known films but you have as well the the um, the the one of life on a bike which is i think particularly life special bike, yes. Uh, yes and, uh, and uh, you have the wonderful it was, was shot and it was my first work uh, in film and in fact the most challenging <laughs> when uh, when uh, francesco died um they asked me what do you want to do and at the time i never produced anything before but in that moment of very acute pain and madness it just came to me, we're gonna do a TV series on cycling. Because unconsciously I knew that this was so impossible, difficult, challenging, never done before, that would take all my mind, heart, being to create. And I think it was in fact, uh, what I was looking for. I, I know that creativity always healed my life and has been always uh, my anchor uh, uh, in, in challenging times. And, uh, you know, th this, these friends, they looked at me like, okay, let's not even say anything. We're just gonna go for it. And uh, here we are, we took the rights of uh, this uh, cycling race, which is the Giro d'Italia, that is just about like Formula One, where the rights belong to one television, the national Italian television. And you cannot take away these rights from the television. And yet I boldly, in that moment of uh, pain and nakedness uh, as a human being, I went to the television, I went to the Giro d'Italia president and, uh, I just asked, I said, you know, I have a new format for a TV series. It's gonna be an American TV series. We're gonna give it to you for free, but you have to give me all the rights to shoot. I wanna shoot it my way and I'm gonna introduce a new format to shoot sports. And I think I was so bold and so convincing that in the end they gave it to me. You know, I mean, despite, uh, of course, uh, Rai uh, television, Italian television, look at me like, you know, and a couple of times on set, you know, on the race, they scorned us because we would arrive with all these American amazing cameramen, you know, that come from the best films, you know, with all the equipment and bold, like, not like Italian cameramen are pretty set for what the television wants. We weren't like that. We were ready at 4 a.m., 25 cameras on set at the arrival at the start in the middle these guys were like uh, crazy and they loved the idea that we were doing something that was never done before in that way so we we went crazy it was very challenging of course <laughs> but uh we learned so much and created a different format uh, of uh, of uh, shooting a race we took it from the training of these athletes and their prayers, what they believe, their families, what it means to actually be inside the race of that level, you know, be actually selected because they have to pass the selection through a series of training and previous races. And then finally train for that race that is excruciatingly painful. It's actually more challenging than the Tour de France because France is pretty much flat when Italy has its very high peak and mountains and stuff. And I will never uh, forget one of the last uh, 
uh, uh, stages of the race was uh, uh, on top of the Mount Stelvio, which is actually steeper than the Mont Blanc in Switzerland, uh, in the Alps. And at the bottom, at the base, when you arrive, it was May, we were all in t-shirts and stuff. When you get up there, the, the, the snow is high like this. It was so cold and it's so steep that no cars who ca could actually drive this road where the cyclists were cycling. And uh, the, you could see these cyclists getting skinniers and skinniers riding up the hill. We were carrying our cameras on the shoulders because the car would just burn down. We arrived up there with these cameras and the snow and these cyclists were taken, literally lifted like deers, like from the stomach up, put in a helicopter and down because they, at that point, they didn't even have the, the strength to, to, to survive, to breathe, you know, it was insane. And, and that kind of race and being there, you know, and doing it that, that way taught me everything as a producer to just break the barrier of thinking, oh, but everybody, it should be done that way. Nobody does it in a different way. They told us, no, you shouldn't do it. Find another way. Think different, get out of the box, put that camera on your shoulders and go, you know? The, the, the footage was tremendous, you know? I mean, it was, uh, it was so beautifully conceived that, that actually right the year later started to adopt the same format for their own program in, in shooting the race. So it was a great conquer and, and definitely it did heal myself and, uh, and the kids. And, uh, and it was a, an inspiring moment, understanding that the power of our imagination is way bigger than the power of pain. Well, that's, that's amazing. And actually it's really, I know from a technical and actually, well, enforced perspective, that's a massive production. And I love that you put all that effort to create the, the, the story of something that is, cycling is one of the most compelling sports in the world. Um, uh, and as well, a very demanding, very psychological, very physical, but just putting all that effort as well to do a documentary on that, it, it's really amazing and, and very special. So, so I want to touch one part that, um, uh, I know that we passed one hour, so if you have a bit more of time, I have a couple of questions more, but I'll try to be respectful of your time. So one, one question is, so you are um, on the bridge of all these different levels of production of documentaries and, and feature films related with very special topics, very unique uh, stories that are actually very, um, I would say very human, but at the same time, very radical in terms of the approach you do it and, and you explain the production part. So I would like to touch right now one part that is, how do you deal right now with all these parts related with the, the digital right now in windows that we have when it comes to film production? Because the film industry is going for a huge, uh, I would say a huge change, because of course we have uh, all the studios, the conventional studios like passing to the streaming studios. And there's a huge right now, in one end, we have the capacity to do fantastic things with an iPhone or, or a Samsung film that, or a phone that has capacities almost of the best cameras. But at the same time, you have as well the possibilities of actually, if you are really very, very uh, creative and a, a very good marketing and producers to really use the tools of YouTube and all social media to promote these films. But my question for you is, I know that you are as well on the board of a couple of festivals and you've been very dynamic as well in different areas uh, and working with a lot of uh, dynamics, supporting a lot of different initiatives. But how do you see right now the film industry? Because in the end of the day, we have right now, everyone has the possibility of coming with these things, but more than ever, we need people like you that have the sense of story and the sense of knowledge because uh, as been, I've been privileged to work with a lot of high profile personalities of film and music, and it's really complex and difficult. Yes, And most of the filmmakers are not good producers, they are more creators. So that's the part that I would like to hear from you, especially in, the, in this kind of digital economy. Uh, that's my question. Yeah, yeah you're, you're, you're right, definitely, Dennis. The industry is changing. Uh, the theatrical distribution is becoming less important, or at least it's been for these two and very sad last years. Uh, at the same time, 
I want to say, you know, there is goodness into these platforms uh, such as Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, you know, because the material is actually tremendously good in many, many cases. Writers got the opportunity to see and show uh, and, and write amazing TV series and films and stuff. But most important, uh, as a filmmaker, do not stay and dwell in it. You have a story to tell. Where it's gonna go depends from how the story told. But until you haven't said the story, don't dwell into the difficulty of the market is changing and stuff. I mean, imagine if Charlie Chaplin was dealing and dwelling into the marketing changing and dwelling from, uh, oh, the movies are not silent anymore and stuff. He was himself, right? He, he had a story to tell with the tools of the moment and he told the story. If the story is good, it will have the market, theatrical, awards, Oscars, uh, Netflix, whatever. You know, certainly I would suggest to a good film, run the film festival and distri theatrical distribution first. Don't go right away on the platform. Don't kill your film right away, right? I mean, if it's possible, do it. Challenge yourself. But at most important, do not stay on the condition of, uh, uh, well, now it's worse, now there isn't any more the possibility. The truth is when the story is beautiful, the world resonates to it. And I give you a good example because I like to speak about facts and not just ideas. Um, right now I'm in pre-production with a, a beautiful film. It's called Polo and it's a true story of a, a group of kids from an unprivileged uh, uh, suburbia part of the, an American city that finds redemption and inspiration through the sports of Polo. And uh, I found this story in a, in a scrap of paper, a little tiny article that was mentioning about it. And, and I read it and it resonated to me, you know. Uh, the, the proof is always when you read it for the first time, you see it. You start to see the image, how you want to shoot it. So you know that it's already carrying you the story. And if it carries you, it will carry probably many, many other people. So in this case, you know, the, the story sat in my drawer for about six months. You know, because I'm thinking, well, I mean, I don't know yet, you know, uh, the only person I told him about it was Lorenzo Soria, which was the, for, the former president of the Golden Globe Awards. And it was a, a dear friend, a father to me and uh, my biggest mentor. He died last year. Uh, but I went to him and I told him about this story and he told me, Vale, this is your Oscar. Go get the rights and do this story, you know? So that stayed with me. And although Lorenzo is dead, uh, the story stayed with me. And I knew that there's, there was going to be a moment to create this film. Now it happened that six months later, I was invited to speak at a Congress in, uh, in Dubai in the Emirates, and it had nothing to do with this film. It was actually about uh, women empowerment, et cetera. And I created a beautiful discussion panel with many of the, uh, the, the sheikahs from the royal families, the wives of the sheikhs, that uh, everybody thinks they are ignorant and they don't know anything. They're actually some of the most highly educated and uh, socially active human being in the planet. <laughs> Let me tell you. Uh, but um, I was there and I was invited to speak and uh, the panel was strong and powerful. And after that, uh, one of the royal family uh, approached me and asked me, what do you want to do next? What are your plans? And uh, at that moment, it came to my mind, you know, I, I have this story that I want to tell. And I know that polo is uh, like soccer in Italy, like football in America for the Emirates. You know, they, they have a history with horse riding and they have the spaces. And I said, look, the story is American, but the meaning is universal. And I know we can do it together. So since then, we signed a partnership with a private uh, royal office of uh, Sheikh Ahmed bin Faisal al Qasimi. Uh, then uh, we, uh, I collaborate with Neredes Group in Paris, who's been uh, close to many of my projects, uh, who developed a, a beautiful business plan and on and on and helped me to 
put together the pieces. And uh, now I just spent uh, periods, long periods in the Emirates who became somehow in this chapter of my life, my second home and uh, created an alliance with Dubai Cares, which is probably the number one organization in education in the world. And we approach the Minister of Sport, the Minister of Tourism and Economy and stuff. This is how you create a film. You don't think about, is it gonna go to Netflix? Is it gonna go? You think about the story and who are your allies and what is the storytelling? Is it an, a universal message? In my case, yes. So I want all the people together to propel this message it can actually unify in a moment of incredible disruption and division in the world can actually unify people through a story. And that's the power of a story. Well, it's, it's really amazing. Your energy and the way you put things in practice, I really love it and it's super special. So I, I want to, and I will try to probably wrap up in a while because it passed one hour, so I, I'm cautious of your time. Um, so, so as someone that achieved these things, and of course, uh, congratulations for this new project that I think I'm looking forward to, to see it because it's from all the concept is already a beautiful, but a very special thing. So how do you see right now, uh, especially the areas? Uh, so we are in a very, I would say, very kind of transitory time where we have fantastic technology, fantastic stories, and like in any time of humanity, but more probably where we are advancing as society, especially with technology advance, taking us to completely different levels but as well with a lot of challenges in the way we see reality and storytelling. Um, so I would like to see, especially how do you see, not going to geopolitics, although you know how to play that very well, but mostly how you see film and uh, entertainment industry to as an instrument to create these wonderful inspirations and, and how do you see this narrative? I know that you are very, it seems like it's a lot by your instinct, the way you, you look at these stories and then you really drive on that because there are stories that drive you and you feel your energy out of that. But the world is, is in a very kind of complex state uh, because we have fantastic things, but as well, very complex. And for me, as, as someone that has been involved in all these entertainment creative industries, but as well in technology, the challenge I feel is, can these tools make us a better society or, or take us to a completely different direction? And I think people like you that are the, the genuine storytellers of history are more important than ever. So I'd like to see how do you see this complexity, but at the same time, how do you put that capacity of yours? And you mentioned marketing, which is a fantastic tool because if you use it right, you can do fantastic things, but the, the impact is more important than ever. Uh, I would like to hear from that angle. Yes, absolutely. And you said it right. It's more important than ever to tell a story, to be human in an era of digitalization the power of humanity has to be triple, not less. You know, I spoke, I was part of an amazing program and forum that was uh, created by Dubai Cares and it, for the Expo, Expo 2020 in Dubai. And it was called Dignified Storytelling. And they invited me to speak among a, 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 a small hand of uh, storytellers from all walk of life and all over the world. And, and it was made this forum with 3000 people uh, because they wanted to enhance the power of storytelling versus an era of digitalization. Because in the end is our spirit, our emotions that drive us not the digitalization. Digitalizations, our tools have to be our wing to fly. Of course, if I can fly first class and get a better program, a better tool, why not, right? Fantastic. But still the story, your emotions, the spirit has to drive humanity, a story, a film, our story our personal story as a human being cannot be identified for the tools we have, you know, the car, the things and stuff, the computer, the iPhone. This is great tools, great twings uh, to navigate, but still, who are we? What do we have to share? Because in the end, that is what makes a difference. We cry at the movie theaters, not because of the special effect, 
is because we feel an emotion that is close to us, because we recognize a moment, a momentum, an emotion, a state of being, and not because of, uh, oh, well, I recognize they use the AVID, they use the right program. No, it's always us. So if we can still recognize in an era of fractures, of confusion, of political division, of, of changing in tools, in systems, the power of humanity is the one who wins no matter what. So if we start from this core, you can't lose. You can't lose. There is no way. The film that wins at the Oscar is always a film that connects with you in the most profound core of your humanity. So let's remember that. Uh, and I say this uh, with particular passion, especially to young writers, to young filmmakers. It's the power of a story that counts. And the story has to be told from the heart. Otherwise it has no sense. Special effect, fantastic. Yes, you know, on the way, you know, get all the tools you want, but it has to have that meaning, that core, that power. If Cinderella didn't believe in dreams, forget about the shoes. You know what I'm saying? She had to believe that there was a fairy, that there was something, that there was a fate for her. Otherwise the, the shoe is okay, you know, whatever. Shoes comes later. <laughs> wow, that's, that's amazing and, and super inspiring. And I, I love this. It's been a, a fantastic masterclass of uh, humanity, but as well of beautiful and uh, wonderful energy so i think um, as a last question and i i, I think we'll we'll ask you to come back to our series <laughs> but uh, i'll do it in a different yeah, way next it. time i would love it then i hope you will be with us uh, throughout the shooting of this film because it's uh, I, I like your energy for sure no no and i have one provocation for you but i'll do it of 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 um, of cameras so, so my last my last moment so you mentioned the most important and especially as this is a, 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 a YouTube channel, very strong on technology. Yes. And I love what you said, because the tools have to empower, it's not the other way around. And, uh, and I think, that, but this is a big challenge. So to finish, and I think uh, being very respectful of your time. So from, um, and I don't know if you want to talk as well about some of the things you want to just tell your audience about you, but yes. what I would like to do is from everything I see is really, you have a force of nature, but it's a beautiful force of nature because there are creators, uh, if you look well, at the Italians, if you see Michelangelo, it was like the, the nervous creator and Raphael. I think probably you are a bit of Raphael, that is the, the beautiful spirit um, and that level, if you look at the, the way you look at the world and, and put a beauty on things, even if the topics are very intense at the stories. But what would be the, the I think, special for people listening to us and as a final um, point, the things that you think we need to highlight more um, for, I think all the people listening to us, because most of my audience are really C-level people yes. and, uh, and as well people that are somehow leading the world for good and for bad. I hope more for good and for bad. But what do we think we need to work? Because I think your strength is, is really beautiful and this leadership and humanity, we need it more than ever. And I need it as well. I think we need to, to share this wonderful energy and amplify it. So I would like to hear your last votes on that because I think it's really important. They have a lot of things, but we'll take it for a second yes. uh, series. Leading, right. Uh, I, I said before a beautiful phrase that I always keep in my heart that a leader is leading people, but a leader is led by his own cause. And that's very, very important in life, even besides films, you know, right now, God knows if there is the need uh, of leadership uh, in this world, and I and I take I, I say this phrase with tremendous care because uh, leadership can go in so so many ways, you know, right now. But I think uh, I think uh, I think there is a, a very big need right now to 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 unite. You know, I I see the world very fractured, and I see the world very scared. And in, in fear, there is nothing we can do. Uh, in fear, there is no creation. In fear, there is no opportunity. This is a state of the fact. Uh, I don't want to be leading people in the wrong direction, but I'll tell you what I did 
in these two years of COVID, I kept on traveling all over the world. I finished three films. I spoke at least at six uh, different international forums and uh, I created this last film from scratch. Why did I do that? Because in moments of fears, go to the light, go to creation, go the opposite way. And I'm not saying break the rules. I didn't break the rules. Fortunately, I have two passports. I could travel. I was very blessed to do it. But besides the tools, again, many people had uh, these opportunities and they didn't do it. I think it's so important right now that people believe in their causes and take them. And don't stop because, oh, the world, the lockdown, the thing, what? You know, why? Because in the medieval, there wasn't the lockdown. Because in third world war, there wasn't uh, uh, the, the, uh, the camps and, and all the horror we've seen. And still there were writers. Primo Levi wrote one of the most beautiful books ever written, as well as many other people that did it no matter what, that escaped, that, that found a way to do art, that found a way to express themselves, to change the course of the story, even if it was just for themselves. People don't think that this would make a difference, but it does, it does. In a world that was still, I moved. I chose right away, wrong way, let's do it another way. Let's find a plane, we're gonna go, we're gonna go this, 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 this. We're gonna approach these other places and find a new narrative in a moment of stillness because spirit cannot stay still. Creativity cannot stay still. Humanity cannot stay still. The way of learning is to move. The way of learning is to move and go towards a, a process. So uh, you have to keep on moving. And uh, I think right now people has to kind of move. I don't, I don't see enough people, unfortunately, with that kind of uh, spirit. And so I'm glad you made this question for me because uh, for me, I made it my life. And, uh, and so for me is my natural reaction right away. Lockdown, okay, let's find a way. Let's, uh, let's disrupt this because uh, there, there are safe ways to do it, there was, uh, but we, there is so much more that we can do. And uh, I, I would like to encourage people to think this way instead of getting entangled with politics and with blockages. With politics and blockages, we don't create. With politics and blockages, there is very little we can do. But with spirit, with courage, with finding a new narrative, with, with creativity, there are millions of ways that can be expressed, created, found, you know, and without being irrational. I'm not talking about being disrespectful or going against the law at all. I didn't go against the law, but I found the way, beat the system in a healthy way with your courage, with your spirit. I think that is the way that leadership has to go right now. That I see people entangled on the news 24 hours a day. And so what does it do? I, do I want to be part of a helping society? Yes, then find a concrete way. I am a global spokesperson for Joblio, which is an amazing new company that found a way to safe immigration and labor work offering a safe immigration to many countries, third world countries and stuff that goes, uh, you know, uh, through that kind of middleman and, and then it becomes human trafficking, you know, the whole system, you know, that is so corrupted into immigration, unfortunately, and you see a lot from Africa going to Italy, people dying on the ocean and stuff and uh, uh, this company does offer a way that is safe for the country they immigrate as well for the immigrant person and find safe work for them. So, okay, I want to be active. I find a positive way and become a spo global sport person for this amazing company. But besides that, I do not get entangled with positive, with, with politics. I have to, I have a cause to lead.
my creativity, my project. So lead. I would encourage people to lead rather than stay afraid and don't face uh, anything in life. People have been stuck now for two years. A relationship broken, marriage broken, love broken, projects broken, life broken. Put the pieces together and do something. Love more, have more courage, have dare more write more create more beat the system well i i'm i'm speechless but i think very grateful this i'm completely agree with you and i think we need this more than ever i think we are in a in a time of uh, lack of leadership and lack of inspiration on that level so we need these narratives i think you 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 are very special a uh, person in a lot of levels has been an honor to have you here and very humble and grateful but as well very it's been one of the most fascinating moments because sharing this energy is very special so i hope we can be face to face soon and uh, and i'm looking forward to see your projects going forward and uh, continue changing and bringing stories that can actually create these wonderful things thank you so much uh, valentina it's been wonderful to have you here Dennis, thank you, thank you so much and I look forward to meet you again very soon.